Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. So, welcome to Module 3 of Week 3. Uh, if you remember, in Module 2, we said that the current expression that you have been using in the past, we wanted to change it by a little bit, namely this g of e, the conductance function, you shift it along energy by the amount of this channel potential. And this accounts for the fact that when you apply a voltage on the drain, of course, the everything in the drain is shifted according to that potential that we always take into account. The fact that the chemical potential in the drain is lowered by the drain voltage, but the channel itself also gets somewhat shifted by that potential. And this drain induced lowering of this channel potential, that needs to be taken into account in the models in order to get reasonable current voltage characteristics. Reasonable meaning what you actually see in experiments. And one of the, <clears throat> and by choosing this factor appropriately, what I had said was you could write the channel potential as some factor alpha, ideally zero, but in practice maybe say 0.1 times the drain voltage, and then there is this beta, again ideally one, times this gate voltage. That's how we could write this. And if alpha is 0.1, what you might find is that this current versus voltage would, instead of saturating, would keep increasing with voltage somewhat, as you see in real experiments. And actually, this increase, you see, that is a, some, is a problem that is getting more and more important as you go to smaller devices. Because, you see, when you go to small devices, that means this length is getting short. And, in, and so, the drain tends to have a lot more influence on the potential in the channel. And in order to make sure that the gate has more, has a more influence on the drain, one has to make this oxide thinner and thinner so that the gate can control the potential more effectively. And people again who work on nanotransistors will tell you that that really is the biggest challenge. That is, as I mentioned earlier, as transistors have gotten smaller, this length has, is now like hundreds of atoms long. But the point is if this is hundreds of atoms, and you want the potential to be controlled by the gate, then the insulator has to be even thinner. In, in fact, usually like tens of atoms. And the real challenge is how to make these insulators that are, you know, tens of atoms thick across an entire wafer of, you know, billions of transistors. And you cannot make it too thin because if it was too thin, there would be, there would be a lot of leakage current. So those are the real challenges of, of, building nano, designing and building nanotransistors, which we are not going into. As I mentioned earlier, there's a course next semester by Mark Lundstrom, which you should be attending if you want to learn about that properly. But the main point I wanted to make here, though, is then this drain-induced lowering is something that needs to be taken into account. Now, to complete the story then, for the moment, let's assume that we have managed to build a perfect transistor with alpha equal to zero, let's say. What that means is that when we change the drain voltage, the potential in the channel doesn't, is not affected at all. So in that case, you might find, I mean, if you use this model, you say, well, U doesn't depend on the drain voltage. And so you'd say, okay, if I use that model, the current would saturate at some value, as we had discussed. Now, the thing is that in practice, actually the current should be quite a bit more than that, easily a factor of two or three. So actually it should be 
what people would find is it is more like something like this. The more complete model will tell you that even with this perfect transistor with alpha equals 0 actually you get a lot more current. And the question is why is that? And that is to include that we have to include change this expression a little bit actually add another term to this expression and that would complete the whole thing. So that is what I want to explain. So why is the current more? Well the idea is something like this. So supposing you have put a large voltage on this and you got this perfect transistor so the channel states kind of stay fixed, don't want to move, it is right there. But the thing to note is that before I applied a potential what had happened was all the states here were filled because you know there was a chemical potential in this contact at this level, the chemical potential here was also at the same level, they were both trying to keep it filled, they were all filled. But once I put a relatively large voltage here, it means that this contact wants to keep it empty. So as I mentioned early in week 1 that current flows because this contact wants to fill it up, that one contact wants to empty it. What that means is that these states actually will be only half full. So not quite completely full. So what that means is that before you applied any drain voltage, let us say we had about 10,000 electrons in the channel. Once I put the drain voltage, I still have just as many states, but they are only half occupied. So instead of 10,000, I now have only 5,000 electrons in the channel. So the number of electrons would change. And if the number of electrons inside change, that itself will have an effect on the channel potential. Because the channel potential tells you that when another electron is trying to come in, you know how easily it can come in. And the point is, if there used to be 10,000 electrons somewhere and now there is only 5,000, that region has effectively become positively charged. It is now much easier for an electron to get in there. And that is reflected in a lowering of this U. And what that means is, this U will become negative and that itself will kind of pull this down somewhat. And if the, depending on the circumstances, you know it could, it would pull this down so, not, so that the total number of electrons would become more like what it used to be. So 10,000 now is only half occupied so it is 5,000 but then if you pull it down you have more states available and even if it is half occupied it might come to something more like 10,000. Now how do I include this effect then into the model that we discussed, you see? What it means is that I need to add a term here for to this channel potential energy which is proportional to the change in the number of electrons in the channel. That is it used to be 10,000 so that that number 10,000, the used to be number is what I will call N0. N0 meaning at equilibrium whatever number you had in your channel and once you have applied a bias and currents flowing you have less than that some other number N and the difference that tells you how many fewer electrons you have and the channel potential energy would be proportional to that and you could put a constant here which I will call U0 and this U0 is like the potential energy change due to one electron. So if in the channel we have, we add one electron then the amount by which the channel potential changes that is what we denote by this U0. So it is usually what in the literature people would call the single electron charging energy. single electron charging energy. So this is the new term then that we have to put in here. So how much is that? 
Well, if I had to estimate it, roughly speaking, one could say that, well, if I put one electron here, one extra electron, how much would the potential of this change? And that you might think would be Q divided by C. This, this is C, I'll write CE. That's the electrostatic capacitance. So if you think of this channel as sort of like one plate of your capacitor, and this is the other plate, then the potential changes, you could say is the charge on an electron divided by this effective capacitance. So this would be the potential, and if you want potential energy, you would call it Q squared. So this is roughly what you could call this, this single electron charging energy. Now, usually what happens is, in large devices, this number is fairly small, the single electron charging energy. Namely, if I put one electron on there, the potential might change by, say, a microvolt or a nanovolt, very small number. Then why are we worrying about it? Well, that's because even if this is a microvolt, but if the number of electrons is hundreds of thousands, then of course the product can be significant. Then the product would still need to be included in our model. And that's the situation with real, with large devices, that one electron doesn't make a difference, but then there's lots of electrons involved, so the product is important. On the other hand, these days people are getting to very small devices where actually when it's something is small, the capacitance is also small, or this C sub E that I put there. That is, on a small thing, even if I put one electron, it can make a significant change in the potential. That is, one electron in a, into a very small region can change the potential a lot, whereas one electron in a very big region makes hardly any difference. So in small devices, actually, this itself can be large, but then there are very few electrons involved. So the device ordinarily might have 10 electrons, and then you might increase it to say 12. So this is a small number, but then this itself can be significant. So there are all kinds of interesting effects that people refer to as single electron charging effects. That's the, or the Coulomb blockade regime, which we will not be getting into, which we will not be talking about. But those arise in small devices with, typically with bad contacts where this U0 is a relatively large number. So for one electron makes, changes potentials by tens of millivolts. But here we are really talking of large devices where this itself isn't much, but then lots of electrons are involved, so the product is important. Okay. Now, if I am going to use this in conjunction with that equation to calculate current, of course I need to know how to calculate the N. See, otherwise I don't quite know how to use this because I need to know N to evaluate U. Now the way you would evaluate the N is the following. That normally the way you write N, this number of electrons, is you integrate over energy. That is you have a certain density of states. So D of E tells you how many states you have. You want to know how many of them are occupied because you are trying to count electrons. So you multiply by the Fermi function. If it's at equilibrium, you just take the equilibrium Fermi function, multiply by the density of states, and integrate over all energy. Integrate means basically sum that in this energy range I got 20 of them, in this one I have 30, this one I have 50, add them all up. Integral is basically just summing it up. So this is what you'd ordinarily have done. In a non-equilibrium problem, of course, we don't have two Fermi functions. We have a one on the left and one on the right. And in this simple small devices, the actual occupation of this channel is halfway between the two, because this is all symmetrically connected. One is trying to make it F1, the other is trying to make it F2. So basically it is just, the occupation is just F1 plus F2, half of that, the average of the two. So you could just write F1E plus F2 of E 
divided by 2. So this is how you could calculate n and of course you'll see here we got these two things n and n0 and if you want n that's the number of electrons under when a drain voltage is applied. So for that you'd use f1 plus f2 like I wrote. If you want n0 then what you should do is that's the equilibrium thing you should just put f1 equal to the equilibrium Fermi function f2 equal to the equilibrium Fermi function. So just replace it by what we had before. Instead of this you'd use f0. That's what you'd use if you wanted to calculate n0. On the other hand when you want to calculate n you should use just this. But in both cases though there is one more thing you need to do and that is you see if this was all then it would be re again relatively straightforward. I could take the density of states find n come in here find u go there calculate current. But what makes it a little harder in practice when you are trying to evaluate this is that I cannot use the density of states the way I have written it because I also have to remember to shift it by u. Remember the whole idea here was that due to the channel potential u the density of states gets shifted down up etc. And so I just as I shifted the g of e by u I also have to make sure I shift the e by the same amount. Now why does it make the practical thing a little harder? Well because you see now I have got two equations. This one relates u and to n. This one also involves both n and u. You see. So if this u were not here I could have just calculated n, put it in here, found u. Now you see the whole thing has to be done self consistently and that is why the standard device models are always self consistent models. That is you have to solve something like this that involves the density of states and how electrons flow and ideas of that sort self consistently with something like this that describes the electrostatics of the problem. This is essentially a Poisson equation. This is essentially some simplified version of the of say Schrodinger equation or what the or some more classical version of it. But those two things always have to be solved self consistently in real problems. And once you have solved it self consistently and self consistently means often the way you do it is you say well let us guess something for you. So for the first for the beginning to get started we say let us assume n is equal to n0. So this term drops out I have got some value of u good. So you take that value of u go down here find n and then we find that well the n is not equal to what I had assumed ok maybe it is a little less. So what I will do is let me change my guess for n. So I originally assumed it was 10,000 after I can recalculate I find that number 6,000. So I say ok let us reduce 10,000 by a little bit. Maybe I will make it 8,000 see if that works. Ok put that back in here now calculate u go back again. So in other words you keep iterating till if you say started with 6,000 here calculate u go back there you get back 6,000. Now of course you will never get back exactly but then you can decide what error you are happy with. So you could say well if the u has converged down to a fraction of a millivolt then we can say ok that is good enough. So that is usually how a lot of these calculations are done and in the homework problem I have also attached one of these self uh, MATLAB code that does self consistent solutions like this which you are welcome to try out. But the homeworks themselves involve results obtained from that code and trying to understand them because trying in terms of simple pictures because doing the calculation is one thing but you so more, more important I mean I could say at least equally important to have a good physical feeling for what it is you are calculating 
so that if you make mistakes, you kind of know that this can't be right. So that's what kind of the homeworks are about. It gives you certain results and asks you to see if you can understand it approximately with simple pictures.